Hello everyone, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am your host, Simon, and this one... Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm recording this in November, but we record these things ahead of time, so you get them at uh, times that are relevant rather than me. So I'm going to be feeling rather Christmassy in November. You're going to be feeling rather Christmassy around Christmas. This is a big script written by Callum. What we do here is uh, I will look into something. Today is the disappearance of Patty Vaughan. I'm going to read through this script. You're going to come along with me. I'm going to add some comments if I feel like it. And uh, let's just jump in, shall we? This is all about, I think I said this already, the disappearance of Patty Vaughan. Christmas is coming, have you noticed? By this point, we've been suffering through Mariah Carey's sugary sweet wailing every time we visited the shops for about six weeks. So by my reckoning, that means it's just another few days until the main event itself. Uh, Callum, who writes this, is also British. I don't know about you guys, but uh, that, that song is just everywhere around Christmas. And it makes me slightly sad because it's just, yeah, sugary sweet. Anyway, enough of being a Grinch. It's a day for coming together as a family, for splashing sickening amounts of cash and something to do with a guy called Jesus, I'm told. Well, that depends on your beliefs. Although I guess if you say, look, I'm not religious and I celebrate Christmas. Everyone celebrates, well, obviously not everyone celebrates Christmas, but a large proportion of people in Europe and America and I guess other places in the world celebrate Christmas. I'm not sure it really got anything to do with Jesus anymore, at least for me. Whether you're a follower of old JC, or not, there's a good chance that you'll be having a family get-together on his birthday. And depending on your family dynamics, that'll be a blessing or a curse. The Christmas dinner table can either be an altar of togetherness or a battlefield for settling all the years' repressed grudges. Uh, my personal, my, my experience is, I don't know, I, I quite like my family. We normally have a good time on Christmas. We have a long meal and we talk about all sorts of stuff and then we fight about politics. But all in good spirits, you know. Uh, but no matter what kind of dysfunction your family unit suffers from, not to say that my family unit doesn't have any dysfunction, because it does, <laughs> you can count yourself lucky in one respect. Nobody's gonna die, right? I mean, you might feel inclined to strangle your uncle when he starts ranting about politics after one too many sherries, but you wouldn't actually go through, through with it. Probably. Apparently, though, some murderously inclined individuals can't even suspend their violent ambitions during the season of goodwill. They turn up at Xmas with knives in hand and guns in hand rather than presents and candy canes. Which brings us to the case of Patty Vaughan, a mother of three in Texas who went missing under mysterious circumstances on Christmas Day 1996. I'm warning you, today's story is a world away from the usual miracle on 34th Street. You might want to have a glass of mulled wine on hand or eggnog or whatever weird stuff Americans drink. I feel like we don't really drink, do we drink eggnog in the UK? I don't live in the UK anymore, and I feel really out of touch. Um, I thought that was an American thing, but uh, it doesn't really matter. All that now I'm regretting is that because it's November rather than Christmas when you're listening to this, I'm just having coffee instead of mulled wine. This could be kind of fun if I was drinking wine. Another, another channel of mine is sponsored by a company called Bright Cellars who uh who ship out boxes of awesome wine like based on your you know wine preferences come on bright sellers get on the uh, casual criminalist train <laughs> and we'll drink while doing these <laughs> they could become substantially worse what are we talking about can you imagine the rambles that i would go on if i was drinking <laughs> i already ramble too much uh let's let's crack on setting the scene it's christmas eve 1996, and with an imaginary drone shot, we're panning high over the town of Lavernia, Texas, about half an hour east of San Antonio. All of that means nothing to me. I mean, I've been to San Antonio, but still, I don't know where it is in Texas. I guess it's somewhere in the middle. Who really knows? It's a small place, a few main roads with pockets of housing leading off, all surrounded by sprawling miles of pasture and woodlands. Yes. This is Texas. In the city park, you can still see the lights of the Christmas tree towering over the central pavilion and the glistening of the slowly melting sledding run made with imported snow to give southern kids a taste of a proper white Christmas. Does that really happen? Wow. Some families are still milling about here. We can see them putting the finishing touches on miniature snowmen as the evening starts to darken. But of the thousands or so people who call this place home, most already tucked away inside having dinner with loved ones. This is a deeply religious part of the United States, after all. 
and it's a place where family is everything. If you don't have the whole family tree crammed inside someone's dining room, it's not really Christmas time at all. One such family is just sitting down as our imaginary drone drops down, hovers by their window. Callum, you have missed your calling as a screenwriter, I'm afraid. This is just all, all people, you know, most people are just listening to this as a podcast. Some people watching on YouTube are probably watching my face being like, Simon, your production value could be higher, couldn't it, mate? Get some drones. Go to wherever this place was, Lavernia or whatever. Do some shots. But I won't. <laughs> okay, this is definitely illegal nowadays, but it's the 90s. And I don't think any drone legislation has been written yet, so relax. Also, back in the 90s, there were no drones. If you wanted a shot like a drone, you had to rent a helicopter and a camera crew and all sorts of crazy stuff. As long as nobody gets naked, we're not breaking any laws. <laughs> all right, then. Anyway, inside, we see a table set with heaped plates of all the Christmas fare. Sat along one side is a woman, early 30s, blonde hair styled into a perm. This is Patty Vaughan. By her side is Gary, an ex-boyfriend with whom she's recently fired up the old flame. That's going to be fun for Christmas dinner. <laughs> who did you bring, Patty? Oh, I brought my old boyfriend who we recently got back together with. And I don't know, someone's going to kill someone. So I'm also speculating that it's, it's going to be a bad time. This is the first time she's ever introduced him to her family. And by the looks of things, it's going really well. I spoke too soon, apparently. He's good with Patty's children, who are sat at the kids' table with their cousins. Her sisters, Barbara, Jenny and Kathy seem to like him too, as does their mother, Patsy Wallace. But most importantly for all of them, Patty looks happy. This is the best Christmas gift they could have ever dreamed of, because for too many holidays just like this one, they've had to watch her cry. For that, they had JR to thank. <laughs> This got dark, and I get the feeling it's going to get a whole lot darker because this is the casual criminalist. At some point, someone's going to get murdered. JR was Patty's estranged husband. Full name, Jerry Ray Vaughan. Despite having a name fit for a country music career, I was trying to think of a good anecdote. I was like, oh, what does he sound like? What is he? But I'm not quick enough. Fortunately, Callum is quicker, and he also has time to think about these things when he writes it. He actually made his living as a construction contractor. He wasn't a bad-looking guy with his slicked back hair and black moustache, but he's not the. He, but he wasn't the best-looking in the world either. A young Patty must have seen something in him. They met just a few years after Patty graduated high school in Okinawa. Wait, isn't Okinawa in Japan? And got married in 1985 in San Antonio. Over the next five years, the couple moved around a lot, with stints in Maine, Georgia, and Virginia before settling down in Lavernia. Along the way, they had three kids together, a daughter, then two sons. Patty doted on her kids and did everything possible to give them a happy childhood. A little sister, Jenny, later told reporters, she was the kind of mother who did everything for her children. She made them clothes. She made curtains for the house. She did everything, even for me. She was like a second mum to me. Oh, and Callum, you've started using the past tense. She was the kind of mother. Like we say, this is the casual criminalist. Somebody is getting murdered, and it seems likely that it's going to be... Or, well, she disappears. That was that was spoiled in the title. By the time the Vaughan settled down in Lavernia, they had the perfect church-going nuclear family image. A hard-working, blue-collar dad, musically talented housewife mother, and three beautiful kids filling their house with noise. But, as is often the case... With small-town suburban bliss, the joy was just surface level. Over the course of their relationship, JR had become progressively more and more controlling of Patty. She was prohibited from working outside their home, and he was known for dishing out demeaning comments. Sounds like a bit of a dickhead. There were even rumors circulating that he had thrown a mayonnaise jar across the room in anger when a family member was visiting. By the time the mid-90s rolled around, several people had noticed some suspicious bruises on Patty's body. Okay, I mean... <laughs> Throwing the mayonnaise jar across the room in anger doesn't seem as bad as, like, <laughs> dishing out demeaning comments to your wife. I've probably broken something in anger or, like, frustration, but I don't demean my wife. <laughs> Throughout 1996, the tensions between the couple rose to a boiling point, and Patty eventually accepted the advice which her loved ones had been giving her for years now. This guy was no good. The relationship had to end. Surprisingly, the next episode was relatively amicable. Patty and JR agreed to a six-month trial separation in October. He went off to find his own place in San Antonio, while Patty stayed with the, in the house with the kids. After 11 years of stress, as her relationship declined into misery, Patty was born anew. She returned to work at a local company, Quinny Electric, and rediscovered much of the women she lost in those tumultuous years of married life. 
this six month trial separation. Patty ain't coming back. By this point, it was safe to assume that she was thoroughly enjoying the trial separation. Callum and I, same page. And she wanted to purchase the full lifetime subscription. Boy, there are so many good options for sponsors. Come on, sponsors. Like right now, it could be like, like a trial subscription to The Great Courses Plus. That one's for free, The Great Courses Plus. They sponsor some of my other channels pretty great sponsor actually if anyone was in doubt uh, over whether the divorce was really on the cards well along came gary he and patty had dated many years before and just so happened to run into each other about a month after a separation as it turned out he himself had just finished off a divorce so they would have plenty to talk about yeah that'd be great <laughs> what do you have in common with both divorced the basis of a solid relationship i don't know maybe it is i don't know what i'm talking about i've never been divorced and that basically brings us that's really weird i'm like i say i've never been divorced and i haven't but i also think i'm far too young to have been divorced and then i realize i'm 33 and i'm way older than i think <laughs> so uh and then basically brings us back to christmas eve 1996 patty and gary are sitting side by side surrounded by loved ones with empty plates in front of them it looks like the next chapter in their lives is set to be far happier than the one that came before but of course, separations are never quite as clean and as simple when there are kids involved. With this, of course, being the first Christmas since the split, Patty wanted to give her kids a semblance of normality, even if it meant putting up with an embittered JR. For her, the kids came first. No questions asked. Good for you. Uh, I agree, that's the way you should do things. So, the plan was that JR would come around to the house to celebrate with them. They'd swap presents, have some lunch, and then Patty would take them off to her sister Kathy's house for a big family dinner in the evening. However, there would be some empty seats at the gathering, because Patty never made it there at all. To hear JR tell it, they had been bickering throughout the entire day until Patty decided to take off in her car at around 6.30 p.m., leaving her kids at home. Patty's sisters later told reporters that that sort of thing was completely out of character for her. To be apart from her kids on Christmas Day was simply unthinkable. But nonetheless, here they were. Patty was nowhere to be found. <laughs> I get the feeling like, JR might be lying. <laughs> Uh, pa allegedly. Patty was nowhere to be found, and the last person to have seen her was JR. Sure, other people had tried to visit that day, but Patty refused to see them. Instead, they were met by JR, who told them his soon-to-be ex-wife was holed up sick inside her bedroom. So suspicious. Anyway, again, this was completely out of character for the family-oriented Patty. Judging by what her family had said about her character over the years, nothing short of a full-on heart attack would have prevented her from put uh, from putting herself together and coming out to greet them maybe she really was having some sort of nervous breakdown at any rate they knew she wasn't having a particularly merry christmas a family member had called in the morning to check in when patty answered it was clear that she had been crying she said that her and jr had been arguing since he arrived he could be heard in the background telling her to get off the phone that kind of toxic environment doesn't make for a happy holiday which is why jr decided it was best to send the kids off to his sister's place for the evening there they stayed the night blissfully unaware that they already they had already seen their mother for the very last time a long Christmas dinner went by with no word from Patty, which got her family worried. On the 26th of December, one of her cousins filed a missing persons report with the sheriff's office, and a search began. Interesting the search began so quickly. I always thought maybe I've just been watching too much CSI. But it's like when an adult goes missing, normally they're like, hmm, the adult just decide. Like when a kid goes missing, it's like red alert or uh, amber alert or whatever they call it in the US. We're going to find that missing kid. But when it's an adult that goes missing, it's like, they probably just left, to be honest. So, well, good for the police going after uh, going after them right away. Nice search begins. The police started out, as they always do in these cases, by putting out a call with a description of Patty's appearance and vehicle, a light blue 1991 Dodge Caravan. I should mention for our British listeners, I don't mean caravan as in the mobile holiday at home sense. Oh, okay. I definitely assumed she was in, like, a caravan. You know, what people go on holiday in. It's just the name of a model of minivan, okay? And if Patty... Why would you call it a caravan, then? And if Patty really had taken off in her minivan at 6.30 on Christmas Day, the authorities assumed she couldn't have gotten very far within the 16 or so hours that had passed. 
The day after Christmas, the Dodge was spotted along the side of the highway near Loop uh, 1604 in South Bexar County. It was Patty's boss from the electric company who spotted the car because it was located just five miles from their office and only 15 miles from our home. Strangers of all, he had told the police that he had driven the same road about 90 minutes earlier. The car hadn't been there, implying that someone had parked it there in the brief interim. With the idea of her skipping town out of the question and her family raising concerns over the abusive character of JR, it now looked increasingly likely that the Bexar County PD were no longer dealing with a simple missing persons case, the kind that is usually cleared up when the person rolls up at a friend's house, but rather they were dealing with a highly suspicious disappearance. So uh, let's take stock of what we know so far. There's an estranged husband and a new boyfriend on the scene, an abandoned vehicle, but no sign of Patty anywhere to be found. No reports of violence or gunshots, but a suspicious set of circumstances on the day for sure. In cases like this, suspicion naturally falls. The next word is going to be husband upon the husband. <laughs> Look, I've seen enough CSI is always the husband. Sometimes it's the wife. Uh, but it was too early in the going. It was too early going to make bold claims, especially with two competing men involved. Don't go jumping the gun and accusing JR just yet. No, but definitely look into him first. Allegedly, 100%. If I'm a cop, I'll be like, look, JR, you got to come down the station to ask us some, answer some questions, son. <laughs> Sure, he sounds like a piece of work, but there might be a twist in store to absolve him. We have to figure out where Patty took off to that night and why. First, let's act like proper detectives. All right, Callum, if we have to. I'm just happy to blame JR immediately, but if you insist, we will look at the evidence. There was plenty uh, for the police to chew on in those early days. On the 27th of December, they were told about the abandoned Dodge. Patty's family had gone out to verify it was hers the day before, and now deputies Ramirez and Johnson of the Bexar County PD were the ones assigned to follow up. Their report from that day offered up some pretty worrying suggestions. The first apparent abnormality was, and we quote here, a dark colored stain on the bottom portion of the rear center seat. Johnson leaned into the minivan to take a closer look, resting his knees on the flooring between the front seats and the door. When he stood up, he noticed dark patches on his trousers. The carpeting inside was damp as if someone had recently scrubbed it clean. Needless to say, there were no fingerprints inside. What's more, when they lifted out the seat itself, they noticed some of the cup holders on the doors had water pooled inside them. Someone has wiped that car down and cleaned it and... Look, things are not looking good for Patty at this point. When they removed a uh, plastic covering from one of the seats, Ramirez noticed what he described as some red and brown stained condensation under the larger, uh, this is a quote, under the larger piece of plastic that holds down the seat belt strap. In case you're still not caught on to what that red and brown staining was, the report uh, concludes that chief forensic serologist Lonnie D. Ginsberg positively identified human blood from the area under the rear seat of the van. We weren't in any doubt about that, Callan. <laughs> this is the casual criminalist. If it's red and it's brown, it is blood. This wasn't the only anomaly. Inside the van was a pile of men's clothing, most significantly a jumpsuit of the kind worn by plumbers and mechanics. Ah, oh, JR, that's you! It was embroidered with the initials J oh, JM. JM. Which, to my keen detective eye, clearly implicates James McAvoy, Julianne Moore, and John Malkovich as potential suspects. I blame John Malkovich. I don't know anything about the girl. But the investigators were somehow oblivious to the Hollywood abductor angle and continued gathering clues. The final strange detail was the flat tire, suggesting the outside possibility that a heavily bleeding Patty had run over a nail, cleaned her car, and then hitchhiked the rest of the way. Look, if I was in court and I was the lawyer defending this guy, look, you know, all you've got to get is reasonable doubt. That is not it. But A, that's ridiculous. Callum and I, same page, and B, there was no puncture mark. The tire had been intentionally deflated as if someone had wanted to nudge the investigators towards that unlikely interpretation of events. So someone's tried to clean this up badly. They've tried to stage the scene badly. Someone's... Now, we. this has been titled The Disappearance of Patty Vaughan, so I'm guessing that maybe we don't know what happened to her. Has it been called The Murder of Patty Vaughan or something like that? So I'm like... I don't know, this person seems really sloppy. Come on, police. Let's see why you didn't catch them. All of this painted a grim picture. Patty was at the very least severely injured, probably worse. Someone had made active efforts to hide that fact, and in all seriousness, who did the jumpsuit belong to? Probably not John Malkovich. I will see you in court! 
Now that they expected a body to turn up sometime soon, police could turn their attention towards the suspects. Gary was a relative unknown to Patty's family, strange in a region of small towns where everyone knew everyone else. Whatever instinctive country folk doubt that might have inspired the officers was quickly asta- uh, assailed by a stellar alibi. I mean, it was Christmas Day after all. Most people had at least half a dozen people who can attest to their whereabouts. Gary was no different. He had been spending time with his own family, and he had only been out of sight long enough to slip off to the bathroom. If he had pulled off a kidnapping and cover-up within those tiny windows of opportunities, he was a true criminal mastermind. But, and we know the person who did this crime is not. But surely a master criminal wouldn't go straight to the police station to take part in a lie detector test. That's just what good old Gary did with the intent of clearing himself as quickly as possible so the police could focus their search where it mattered. He's a good bloke, Gary. I've always liked him. All right, Callum. We don't, I don't really know much about him. Also, lie detectors don't hold up in court, right? And also, I heard that, you you know, if you know what you're doing, you can trick a lie detector test. <laughs> Someone said if you, uh, if you clench your butt cheeks... When you're answering the question, apparently it throws it off. I don't know if that's true, but apparently lie detectors are not, you know, definitely not 100%. Uh, And despite only meeting them once over the following days, Gary won the trust of of the family too. Jenny later recounted, We didn't really know him. We only really got to know him while we were searching for Patty. He was out there searching with the rest of us, except JR. He never came out to help look for his own wife. Allegedly, that's because JR knows where she is. Her body is. Maybe. That's right, JR couldn't even be bothered to join the crowds combing through the fields and brooks for a sign of Patty. Barbara even took a stack of flowers over to him so that he and the kids could pass them out. When she returned a few days later to grab some personal effects for the search dogs, she noticed the flowers were still there untouched. And look, JR, we've already established that you're a dick. Um, One thing is like, yeah, you don't want to look for your wife because you don't like her anymore because you got divorced. Fine. But how about looking for your kid's mum, JR? That'd be good. JR was faking tasks, very suspicious. Uh, that's a fact which in modern parlance would call highly sus. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't try and sound cool, Callum. It doesn't suit me. With suitor number one eliminated from suspicion, the cops had all the more reason to suspect number two, JR. He didn't exactly do much to win over public opinion, which almost seems like a counterintuitive point in his favor. Surely if you were guilty, you wouldn't act so damn guilty. That is fair. Like, if I was in JR's position, I definitely murdered my wife and did what people... I'd be like, no, 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 I got it. We got to go look for her. Let's try all of the places that I haven't hidden the body. Uh, I mean, he actually filed for divorce on the 26th, the same day Patty's family were just starting to figure out that she probably wasn't coming home. Dude. Sure, a Christmas Day bust-up might... Dude, you look so guilty. You, you're trying to look guilty. <laughs> it's like some reverse psychology thing. Sure, a same-day Christmas bust-up might have been enough to tip him in favor of full separation, but surely he could have waited until his wife showed up alive first. Interviews also revealed that JR had already told his landlord that he would be moving out in December, perhaps expecting a reconciliation. Or maybe not, because Barbara revealed that Patty had asked her about how to get a restraining order while they cleaned up dinner on Christmas Eve. Uh, Despite all these shady circumstances, JR started off by cooperating with the police. He told his story of how Patty and he were fighting all day. Still, he had found out about her new boyfriend on the 13th of December, and this was the first opportunity he had to really hash it out with her. Arguing is not illegal, though, so there was nothing to directly implicate him in foul play just yet. But it all adds up, doesn't it, JR? The arguing, the craziness, the fact that you're a massive dickhead... Judgment would have to be withheld until they could search Patty's house, now legally occupied by J.R. Motive, whose name was on all the paperwork. They would also need to get a hold of DNA from all the parties involved to compare against samples found in the car. So, J.R. welcomed deputies Ramirez and Johnson with open arms and gave them the samples they needed, eager to clear his name of any wrongdoing and set them on the trail of the real culprit. Oh, no, he didn't. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) I mean, I get it. Like, but they're going to come back with warrants and they're going to take that stuff anyway. You're just making yourself look mad guilty, JR. Jerry Ray Vaughan instead started batting down the hatches. He lawyered up and refused to give DNA samples for himself or his children unless the deputies could provide a warrant. Okay, so now we can go ahead and start accusing JR. Sorry for the delay. Callum, I've been accusing JR since page two. 
Yes, with his sister and personal attack dog Marion by his side, JR hunkered down at his home that he once lorded over as a domestic despot, throwing mayonnaise all over the place. The children were just six, seven, and nine years old at the time, old enough to generally know what was going on, but not nearly old enough to understand the full implications of this new arrangement. You're living with your murderer dad, allegedly. It'd be really bad if we end this and it turns out JR was totally innocent or something like that. I. I don't read these ahead, in case you couldn't tell. The poor kids couldn't even relax for a few days to let it all sink in, because they would have to be ferried out of the house once again. It was time to search the place. Somehow, J.R. and Marilyn were allowed to stay in the house during the whole thing, and the investigators suspected that they were conspiring to interfere with the forensic team's efforts. Marilyn, in particular, refused to leave the technicians to work in peace. I'd like to think that the technicians, in this case, they would be aware of this, and they would just ignore her and get on with their jobs. Why might that be, you ask? Well, let's take a look at the police report, dated the 29th of December, 1996. The forensic technicians who attended the scene used a substance called luminol. I know all about this because of CSI. <laughs> Uh, for those unfamiliar with this nifty bit of chemical wizardry, luminol is a substance which radiates a blue light when it comes into contact with an oxidizing agent. I believe, unless CSI lied to me, that you spray the luminol on and then you shine a light on where you've sprayed and if it's come into contact with blood, it glows all blue. And I remember this because there was an episode of CSI where the dude, I think his name was Greg, he was demonstrating like how it works and he sprayed on too much and it corrupted the DNA of the blood and so the guy got away with murder or something poor greg <laughs> so what's an oxidizing agent well blood is a pretty good one so much so that it will cause luminol to light right up with its signature luminescent glow even if only small traces are present say for example after a crime scene has been cleaned up leaving only amounts of blood invisible to the human eye look jr you should have set the car on fire really i mean it was a badly staged crime scene <laughs> It can also reveal hidden footprints, drag marks, and cleanup patterns in a crime scene, painting a clearer picture of what might have happened there. Needless to say, by this time, the detectives got into full swing. Patty's house was glowing like a full moon party in Thailand. That's not to say that the place had been totally coated in blood. Substances like bleach can also cause luminol to shine, and that accounted for much of the patterns in the house. Although... <laughs> in the car or whatever or in the house it's like yeah what did you find well lots of blood and more bleach <laughs> what do you think that bleach was used for guys clearly someone had been very busy doing a bit of post christmas cleaning i wonder who it was jr the greatest reactions were in the bathroom the bathtub itself and the bedroom floor follow-up tests revealed that patty's blood did account for much of the staining and that it was even found in significant amounts on a mop and bucket inside the garage it's pretty clear that whoever cleaned up the house was not just dealing with an overturned gravy boat indeed so we have our smoking gun a sodden mop perhaps not the most glamorous piece of evidence but it should do the trick i mean this couldn't be any clearer if jr had sent the detectives a card with a message merry christmas i did it so, why do I have the feeling that things aren't going to wrap up in a nice, neat ending? Because if they did, this wouldn't be that interesting of an episode. Also, I wouldn't have a big, thick stack of pages yet to go through. That's how I know. And now you guys know. When interviewed in 2007, Barb revealed that the house wasn't actually ever sealed off as a crime scene, even after all of those damning tests came back from the lab. There wasn't a single strip of police ta tape across any of the doorways, and JR was allowed to continue living in the place. More disturbingly, he was allowed to bring the kids back in. Why? <laughs> we can hear you shouting. Why, even with so much circumstantial evidence, were the police reluctant to point the finger? Well, there are a few reasons. Barb attributes it to mismanagement in the investigation. You see, the town of Laviena is located in Wilson County, but Patty's car was found in Bexar County. This led to a lot of tossing back and forth between the two jurisdictions, as well as some involvement by the Texas Rangers, resulting in miscommunication and all sorts of administrative impediments, which you really don't need in the early days of a disappearance case. Yeah, I feel this is just something I know from movies. But every time there's a crime scene, someone from another agency shows up and starts shouting that this is my jurisdiction or something like that. And apparently it's not good for solving cases. The second reason was that this happened in Texas. Every country, and indeed every state, has its own approach to murder investigation. In Texas, things mostly revolve around the mantra, no body, no crime. Really, Texas? Really? Because getting rid of a body is impossible. 
There have only been a few limited murder convictions in the state without a body to back up the case, meaning that circumstantial evidence just doesn't hold as much weight there as in other parts of the world. And so, the investigation avenue labeled JR Obviously Did It Boulevard <laughs> was seen as a dead end. If that doesn't, if that sounds counterintuitive to you, well, wait until you hear this. The warrants which the detectives acquired for DNA samples from JR and the kids even stated, in words carrying legal weight, that enough evidence had been gathered to surmise that a murder had been committed in the house <laughs> don't clench your jaw too much it is ridiculous so where do we go from here i don't know i'd like to see going to a courtroom where jr ends up going to prison but i get the feeling that's not going to happen because apparently in texas no body no crime i feel like this is something jr would just shout at the police like no with a knowing smile like hey guys guess what no body where's the body guys no body no crime no body, no crime. Oh, JR. Classic JR. I think it's fair to say we haven't jumped to any conclusions, but rather the conclusion has jumped at us, like one of those fish which leaps right out of the water and into a fisherman's boat. Great, we've caught a nice bit of dinner, but we still haven't caught the culprit. In lieu of a body, there was little hope of any major progress, so finding Patty was the number one priority. The usual procedure of combing through the surrounding woodland continued on, but there were another few possibilities which Patty's family believed would likely yield the devastating results that they half needed and half feared. One was, of course, the family home. Why go to all the trouble of taking a body into the woods when there's a perfectly good burial lot out back? I don't know. Because that's where I'd immediately look for the body if I was a policeman. Oh, look, this freshly turned over soil in the garden in the shape of a body. Let's definitely look there, not look there. <laughs> the other possibility was a little less conventional. Remember I told you that JR was a contractor for cons- Oh, he buried her in the cement, didn't he? Oh, no. Well, have you ever seen a mafia movie? I have, Callum, and that's how I drew that conclusion. At the time, he was working on two different projects, both of them schools. Oh, no, and he buried her body in a school allegedly oh no the closest to patty's home was natalia high school in the town of divine just short of 60 kilometers away at that site jr was in charge of pouring the concrete for the foundations this is i come on this guy come on really police really justice system unfortunately the family would have to wait several years before either of these potential burial spots were investigated properly so we're going to have to share the frustration and wait a little while before we go snooping around. In the meantime, a word on the aftermath. What did JR, after seemingly getting away with murder, go on to do? I really hope it's not more murders, but I sense it's more murders or at least more bad crimes. Well, after staying in the house, which he once shared with Patty for a while longer, he then moved out of town. It must be pretty hard to go out and run errands when everyone in town is pretty convinced that you killed your wife. His new home was down south, near the border of Mexico. I don't want to slip into baseless speculation here. Sorry, Callum. <laughs> I realize that the first eight pages, all I've been doing is slipping into... I wouldn't call it baseless, but I would call it speculation, or as I like to refer to it, allegedly. But I will say that if I were anticipating a body might soon be found, I'd want to live awfully close to the Mexican border. <laughs> Although with that giant wall that Trump has now completed, not really, he's not going to get very far. Of course, he took the kids with him. There was no legal basis which could force him to surrender custody, so as much as it broke their hearts, Patty's family had to watch as their children disappeared from their lives. Although clearly a horrific and vindictive move, her sister Barbara actually saw a bit of twisted protectiveness in it. She admits herself that her family weren't shy in calling JR, JR out. Why would you be? Imagine the rage of having to watch him walk around town with your niece and nephew, knowing in your heart that what he had more than likely done. So JR chose to spare his kids all the gossip and animosity which now surrounded their little lives. What a saint. Yeah, JR, just, just, I'm sorry. Why it's hard? Because it's like, maybe he didn't do all this crime stuff. I mean, I mean, come on. But like, you know what? I'd feel bad if his kids were taken away. Would I? No. He went off without even as much as an explanation, robbing the family of a further three loved ones. Since they were so young at the time, JR and his sisters, particularly Marilyn, were able to control the narrative and bring them onto the opposing side of what became an ongoing feud against Patty's tribe. Years passed like this, with the case not quite going cold, but never really exactly warming up above tepid. The family burned through piles of cash within the first year or so, pooling their funds to hire private investigators, and they hoped to catch that one key piece of evidence which would lead to justice 
justice, and more importantly, closure. Look, this is Texas. Apparently, the one piece of evidence they need to find is her body, which he's probably dealt with if he hasn't. Well, he is an idiot. He does seem very incompetent, so maybe he hasn't destroyed the body. Now, I know I caught your attention with the mention of the concrete foundations at the school. You sure did, Callan. It's too unique of a detail to just slip by, so let's take a look. It took five years before investigators decided that they had enough due cause to investigate the site, bringing us forward to 2001, which, for those keeping track, that's four years from the Christmas when the murder happened, so, uh, allegedly. Thankfully, they didn't have to tear up the entire floor during class time because modern science offers some less invasive solutions. Oh, can they scan into the concrete? That's cool. Ground penetra pre penetration radar uh, can reveal anomalies in a solid substance, which would allow officers to identify exactly where they needed to dig, if anywhere. Now, there are two somewhat conflicting accounts of what happened next, depending on who you believed. Here, Detective Ruben Aravelas tell it, they searched multiple times and found nothing worth following up on. Patty's aunt, Jean Cl Clabassa, really, I might be pronouncing that wrong, or her name might be Clabassa, on the other hand, claims that the claims that on abnormalities were found, and they weren't allowed to continue looking into it further. That seems a bit unlikely. I'm going to go out on a limb and side with the investigators here. Me too. Uh, often a family's drive to find their loved one can amplify any little bit of hope, any minor piece of evidence which normally wouldn't even register at all. That would account for the visions of another of Patty's aunts, Kathy Greiner, who says she had vivid dreams that her little niece is buried under that school. Nothing can convince her otherwise. Yes, uh... Kathy, but unfortunately, while we do have all of this evidence and circumstantial stuff, your dreams are not evidence or anything we should go off. Uh, in reality, official records state that the concrete pouring was completed around four days before Christmas. The dates just don't quite align. This is probably why it likely took so long to pursue the angle in the first place. And so time ticked on as it tends to do. Another four years of hurt, another four years of not knowing. Just as things seemed to have gone totally quiet again, JR pulled a stunt which ripped open the old scars. He had Patty legally declared dead in 2005. It has been nine years, so uh, you gotta do it at some point, right? You can't just leave it open forever. This meant he would be eligible to collect her life insurance money, a fact which drew a resounding hell no from the pro Patty clan. They took him to court with a wrongful death lawsuit, which prompted JR to tell the media that they were trying to get their hands on the cash themselves. His best legal gambit was to roll out roll out his eldest Brittany, who is now in her mid-teens. She was there to tell the court what a fantastic father JR was, despite her very presence suggesting the exact opposite. This was the first time she had seen her aunts, uncle, and grandmother since her mother's death. Either following orders or unable to bear the stress, she shielded her face from their side of the room. Yeah, I mean, she's been brainwashed into it. Or on the other hand, if, against all odds, JR is innocent, I don't think that I would want my, if I was in JR's position and it turns out I was completely innocent and this was all some big stitch up and mistake, but my family were, or like my uh, family-in-law were all accusing me of murdering my wife the whole time, I'm not sure I would want my kids to see them either. The judge took one look at the family circus setting up in front of him and decided that he wouldn't let a young girl be exploited in his courtroom for the sake of scoring a few sympathy point points. He gave JR a telling off and had the girl sent out of the room. And thankfully, he also blocked the ex-husband's collection of the money too. Instead, it went into a trust to be collected by the children when they came of age. The lawsuit itself never reached a final conclusion, however, as Patty's family chose to drop it out of fear that the financial burden on JR might have a negative impact in, on the kids. Well. This is the result you would want, right? You wouldn't want the money for yourself, assuming you're, you know, a good person. You'd want it for the kids. And it seems the judge set up a trust so that, well, that family don't have it, JR doesn't have it, the people who should have it have it. That sounds like a win. The patience and restraint of that decision must have been pretty superhuman. So things fizzled out again, and the family had to make do with waiting for leads to trickle in little by little. Then in 2008, the detectives of Bear County received the cold case file from their neighboring jurisdiction and decided to take another run at it. This time, they specifically focused on the jumpsuit found inside the car. Was this piece of evidence relevant, or just a ruse put there to throw them off the trail? I mean, an embroidered logo with someone's initials placed inside a crime scene is pretty conspicuous, maybe too much so. At any rate, it should have received far more attention back in late 1996 than it did. Running through all the old evidence and statements, the police managed to add a bit of life to the dying case. They surmised in December 2008 that given the relatively short time between disappearance and investigation, and the amount of cover-up which had been achieved, the prime suspect couldn't have done it alone. They identified three potential accomplices who may have helped in the disposal of the body. 
Uh, However, they weren't willing to identify them to the press as no arrests were planned at that point. I think there's one person we can safely assume might have made that list. Yeah, it's Marilyn, the sister, for sure. A certain sister, yes, of a suspected murderer, who went out of her way to impede a team of forensic forensic investigators. Hold that thought for a moment. It'll soon become even more relevant. We're jumping forward another four years to 2012. We're now firmly in the middle of the Blu-ray era, following a case which began on VHS. Thank, thanks to Callum for those... Uh, 90s references making me feel old. It's taken this long to discover one of the most crucial elements in the entire case. Ten years after he first looked inside the old Dodge 1991 caravan abandoned off the freeway, Deputy Ramirez ran over it with a tooth comb once again. Further analysis of the DNA in Patty's van revealed that mixed in among her own were traces of someone else's. It belonged to a mystery woman who had in some way been involved in the disappearance of Patty. Now, Ramirez obviously had a good idea who it might belong to. It's the sisters. That's what the smart money says. And I've already dropped a hint heavily enough to crush you. Oh, <laughs> guess I'm not as smart as I thought, Callum. But unfortunately, to get a DNA sample from the most likely suspect, he would have to demonstrate probable cause, something which he simply wasn't able to do at this point. Anyway, that's not exactly new information. We always suspected Marilyn. But it is a clear physical link which could implicate the alleged killer's alleged accomplice should a body then be found. Remember, it's Texas. And we might yet have one last shot of finding it. It's 2014, and finally, the police are going to dig up the garden at Patty's old home. It really took this long. We were scanning in the concrete before we looked in the garden. By this point, JR is of course long gone. There's no one to demand a warrant or disrupt the dig. Even more significantly, the investigators have a solid tip to go on. A neighbor reported hearing equipment being moved around the garden on the 25th and 26th of December, 1996. That dude's got a good memory. He left the tip with the authority several times, but this was somehow the first time anyone followed up on it. Really? So back in the day, they were like, it seems like someone's burying something in the... Let's definitely not look into that. Let's not look into that at all. A team of Texas Rangers went along to the house, accompanied by some FBI advisors. Together, they dug up the area at the bottom of the lawn, and they found nothing. Nothing but frustration. We were expecting more. <laughs> Another person who shared that pessimism was Jolene Molenkoff, one of the Vaughn's neighbors back in 1996. She was pretty scornful of the ranger's efforts, which came along almost 18 years after the fact. In her eyes, there ever really was a body buried there. It had long since been shifted. Too little, too late. Absolutely agree with Joanne on this one. Also, JR is of course long gone. Where did he go? Did he finally go to Mexico? I mean, I guess if you know you've buried a body somewhere in the garden, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, at some point you're going to flee. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you, but our story doesn't go much further than that, I'm afraid. This is one of those cases in which the detectives seemed to do most things right, and which wasn't obstructed by any major mysteries. For all intents and purposes, the damn thing seemed solved. But due to a few technicalities and a smidgen of red tape, the whole thing faded out without any arrest ever being made. 2,000 hours of police time and no payoff. The story is left without an ending, which means that it's either still to come or to be forever left unfinished. But if we can't have the story we want, let's indulge in the story which the evidence seems to tell. Before I go any further, I'll state that everything which follows is essentially just conjecture. Yeah, really important with all of this stuff that we just restate that this is definitely, most assuredly, allegedly, although JR's, JR's run off somewhere, so uh, I guess we don't have to worry about him. But you know, all of this is just Callum's wild speculation, which I'm probably going to fully agree with. With that little disclaimer out of the way, here's the story of how a murder suspect, Jerry Ray Vaughan, probably, allegedly, murdered his wife. On Christmas Day 1996, JR came around to the house of his estranged wife, Patty. He greeted their three children with hugs and wished them Merry Christmas. The performance of normality seemed to be starting off well. After giving the kids their presents and seeing what else Sandra brought them, the adults took some time aside to talk. The boys went out to play basketball while their daughter played with her new toys in the other room. JR, again, Callum, you miss it. You missy, you've missed your calling as a screenplay writer. JR had found out about Patty's new boyfriend and he wasn't happy. The shock was probably still quite fresh, as he only discovered the fact less than two weeks before. His wife had a boyfriend. Suddenly, the idea that their separation was just temporary became a naive and humiliating fantasy. Of course, for a man used to controlling his wife's life, a major transgression like that couldn't go unanswered. The discussion turned, as it always had in the dying months of their relationship, 
heated. Insults were hurled. Past grievances renewed. Maybe mayonnaise was hurled. It was a mess. Much of it likely overheard by Brittany, who had already grown used to blocking it all out. At some point early on in the whole thing, the phone started ringing. Patty answered and was hit with a cheery Merry Christmas. Words with a bittersweet sting to them, considering how little merriness was filling her home. After a brief exchange, she hangs up the phone and goes back to the argument, trying to explain to JR that it was all over. The back and forth continued for who knows how long, with the phone ringing on unanswered in the background. It became clear that Patty was no longer the kind to bend and bow to JR's commands. She tells him that she's moving on, that she wants to be with Gary. What happened next is a tale as old as time, an alleged tale as old as time. In a blind rage, the scorned husband attacks his wife maybe with mayonnaise. He likely used a weapon which would leave enough blood for the search to later find. A knife, perhaps. Within a second, it's over. Patty drops to the floor, bleeding out. The phone rings again as the last few moments of Patty's life slip by. On the other end is Gary, calling to see how things are going. He's worried about her, because he knows what JR is capable of. But he never expected anything like this. With a body lying dead in front of him, JR panics. He doesn't know what to do. Caught in that moment of come down in which a callous killer is reduced to a ter terrified child, he calls his sister, and he has her take the kids out of the house. One of them contacts some other associates and has them help clean up the house and dispose of the body. JR might be a dickhead, but apparently he's got some great friends. <laughs> I cannot possibly imagine murdering anyone. I. I don't think there's a single friend I could call who'd be like, yes, yeah, Simon, I'll help you dispose of a body. <laughs> and not because I don't have good friends, but because I'd kind of expect my friends to call the police on me. <laughs> I'd probably call the police on my friends. While waiting for his... Am I a bad friend? While waiting for his help to arrive, JR moves the body to the bathtub. Over the course of the next few anxious hours, he has to turn friends and family away at the door with a bogus story. Eventually, his morally questionable helpers arrive. Together, they scrub every inch of the bathroom and the bedroom with bleach and drag the corpse of the victim out to a car. As dinner time rolls around, JR deals with all of the inquiries from concerned relatives, telling them that Patty won't be coming around for dinner because she's, uh, gone. She's just taken off. Bye! <laughs> It's now well into the small hours of the 26th, and whoever's in charge of the disposal drives the body to... Well, if I knew that would be calling the police, not revealing it here on this podcast, sorry to disappoint you. After getting rid of this crucial piece of evidence, they scrub the car clean, deflate a tire, and leave it on the side of the freeway. With that, the physical practicalities were dealt with, and all that was left to do was to set up some legal barricades and retreat into a post-murder life with full custody of the children. The women who brought each of them into the world was gone. JR had beat the system, but faced a lifetime of knowing exactly what he had done. Who knows what kind of toll that can take on a person. I hope it's a heavy one. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't do this. I couldn't kill anyone because I'd just be living in like, oh no, <laughs> I killed someone and they're going to find out. Um, and also because it's, you know, morally terrible. Uh, but JR's a bit of a dick. I, I think he probably was okay with it. No matter how shoddy it might have all been allegedly carried out, without a body, there was nothing anyone could do to crack the case. End of story. And now we've got a bit of a wrap. This is this is sad. I mean, we never get to find out. I guess, you know, a lot of crimes are not solved. This is one of those times. And now we've got to wrap up. Now again, that's just all conjecture. But come on, you're with me, aren't you? Yes, Callum, we're with you. We're definitely with you, allegedly. Maybe a few details are off, like perhaps JR actually loaded Patty into her car alive in an attempt to save her. Who knows? Not that it matters. Unless some major development comes along to break the case back open again, it's unlikely we'll see it solved anytime soon. All that's left is to look at where things stand in the present to see if there's any hope of a conclusion. First of all, what happened to JR? Well, now he's living in Colorado under a completely different name, on account of all the media attention that was piling on his head. And no, we're not going to dox him on the show. This is the casual criminalist, not the casual vigilante. Okay. <laughs> okay, Callum, if you say so. To add, I like being the casual vigilante. That could be a new podcast. <laughs> To add to the sadness of the whole affair, none of the children have ever seen Patty's side of the family since Brittany was ushered out of the courtroom in 2005. By now, they're not children. They're all in their 30s. Some of Patty's family suspect that they may, might actually hold the missing piece to the whole puzzle, but as of yet, none of them have come forward to reveal what happened on Christmas Day all those years ago. Brittany was in the next room according to JR's police statements after all. One of the family members attempted to contact her through MySpace. Remember? 
this took place back in the day. But shortly after the message was sent, her account was deactivated. It seems that whatever Pertie's children think of the whole affair, it's been colored by decades of exposure of JR's side of the story. But the family still haven't given up. In their eyes, it's not even about vengeance anymore. Patty's aunt has gone on the record saying that she wouldn't care if the culprit didn't spend a single night in jail. Their main goal is to find her remains and lay her to rest with a proper funeral. Yeah, but if they found out who did it, they'd, they'd you know, it'd be good to see him go to prison. As Jenny put it in a recent interview, it's just devastating to lose my sister and to lose those children. They were like my siblings. We just want this nightmare to be over, and even more than justice, we just want to be able to lay her to rest. We want to be at peace. Her sister Barbara spent much of the 90s and early 2000s leading her own search for information with a website called findpattyvaughn.com. Nowadays, the URL is dead with a 404 screen, just the symbol of the family's withering hopes. With Patty's mother pushing 80 years old and suffering from cancer, they hope now more than ever that a break might come soon. Which brings us to the final part of the show where we ask, is there any chance that you at home might know something that can help? The Charlie Project is a database of missing people across the USA, and they describe Patty as follows. Height, 5'6 to 5'7, weight 120 pounds. Distinguishing characteristics, blonde hair, green eyes. Patty's ears are pierced. Her maiden name is Brightwell, and her last main name may be spelled Vaughan by some agencies. Uh, so just a slightly different spelling of Vaughan. Uh, she has a small mole on her right side of her chin and an appendectomy scar on her abdomen. If that description or anything else in the show rings any bells, then contact the Bexar County Sheriff's Office, who are still in control of the cold case today. Perhaps my appeal isn't hitting home enough for you, so I'll wrap up with the words of Barbara. In 2007, she sent out a message to Patty's oldest child during a radio show, and I think it's worth rebroadcasting it now, 13 years later. I'll read it. I would tell Brittany that we love her so much, and her brothers, Ray and Tyler, and that her mother loved her more than life itself, and would have done anything for her. I promised her, the last time I saw her, that I would find her mother, and I still mean that today. Best of luck, we are rooting for you. So there you have it, a Christmassy tale of murder and the merry perversion of justice. It's by no means a cheery story to tell when you're sitting around the fireplace, but, <laughs> but you didn't tune into the casual criminalist for that, did you? But is an interesting case nonetheless. While we wait to see if anything comes of it in the years ahead, it's left to me to try and extract a non-depressing takeaway from all of it. Okay, Caleb, good luck with that one. Here goes. It took Patty's family another 10 years before they could bear to celebrate Christmas again. It's not a good start, Callum. So far, it's just miserable. When they were finally able to bear the emotional strain and come together, they left an empty seat at the dinner table for her, an altar to her memory, dressed with cutlery and napkins. But unlike on that unhappy Christmas night in 1996, the empty seat wasn't a source of anxiety. This time, it actually brought them comfort, because acknowledging the absence allowed them to hope, wherever Patty might be, that ultimately, she was at peace. So I guess the next time you sit down with your family, whether on Christmas or not, let's be thankful for the seats which are filled. Merry Christmas. That's a very nice ending. You achieved it, Callum. Well done. Dismember dismembered Appendices Number one. During the first few years of the search, a woman claiming to be a psychic contacted Patty's mother. Oh no. I'm so skeptical any time the Sky Psychics get involved. Oh, God. This woman went on to create a pretty grim and melancholy website to try and spread awareness, but the forum page descended into, vit into a vitriolic brawl between JR's accusers and defenders, and the whole thing was taken down. People acting uncivil online? Surely not. Uh, second, despite the family bringing out national networks, NBC, Fox, CBS, and ABC within the first days of the whole affair, they soon packed up and lost most of their interest. Why? Because the disappearance happened on the exact same day as that of six-year-old John Bennett Ramsey in Colorado, which is a much more famous case, and possibly one we could cover here on The Casual Criminalist in the future, if you would like. If you're watching on YouTube, let me know in the comments below, or um, if you're watching on a podcast. I haven't set up an email address for this show, but I will, because then you can write in and suggest things. Number three. In February 1997, Patty's mother did something which I'm sure a lot of others have imagined giving a go. Desperate for her answers, she barged into JR's home at 3 a.m. and attacked him with a baseball bat. She was charged with burglary and assault, then released on a $50,000 bond. All in all, it was probably a small price, price to pay for that satisfaction. And that is where we end this Christmas special of The Casual Criminalist. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you're listening on YouTube, give this, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, give this a thumbs up. If you're listening on podcasts, wherever you get those, please do leave us a review. It really does make a big difference. It gets this show into the earbuds of more people listening out there. So that would be great. And yeah, just to reiterate, have a very Merry Christmas. And I'll see you in the new year. 